How would you feel if somebody came in now and just sort of just started strangling me? Um, well, I do not feel connected to you, Andrew, and mm. not in a bad way. Yeah, it's upsetting. It takes like a very long time for me to feel an emotional connection for the most sure. part. You know, I may feel an energy. I may feel like, oh, this is a good vibe. Do you feel a good vibe with me? Uh... Would I be able to convince you to take the sellotape from the camera? Mm -mm. Because I'm sure by this <laughs> by this point, mm. you know, I do have like a a new book proposal coming, and I do want to do press. Yes, yes, mm. for that, right? But I think before that happens, I'm still like in this like it makes no sense to do it for some random thing. And I yeah. also think there's there's a lot of deniability about who I am or whatever. You know, people still ask me. Because in the book, I think you've read it. Is that right? Yeah, I read it years ago and now I'm mm -hmm. reading it again. And I've just got past, uh, I'm a very slow reader, but I've just got past uh, you having appendicitis, which was, I'm like reading, it's reading a horror book for me. <laughs> it might, maybe it wasn't for you in the time, but I, I keep uh, waking up my girlfriend and saying, oh, you you got to hear this bit. It's it's really quite riveting. And I'm not just saying that because you're on the podcast. It really it's and very uh -huh. well written as well. So uh, yeah, what were you saying? Oh, so at the very, very end, it's like, hey, you know, like this is a pseudonym. And if you really want to know my identity, just write me, email me. And so I still get requests from that. People saying, hey, what's your identity? <laughs> and then I do make them sign a, a mutual non-disclosure agreement. <laughs> really? Yeah. I can talk to Sellotape you. Okay. That's okay. As part of the second book, I've been like traveling around, meeting other psychopath identifying people. And since... COVID-19 has happened and I can't go travel around anymore than I just like meet with them on Zoom. But I always talk to sellotape them as well. In fact, I suggest to them <laughs> that they do the tape. You guys are like propping up the sellotape industry. Yep. There's like 1% of psychopaths. Is that right? Or sociopaths? So it's the same thing, isn't it? Well, you know, in the United States, I think it's, it's much more interchangeable for whatever reason. Hmm that it's very common to hear both. And then when I talk to British people, though, they're like sociopath. They, they think of sociopath as almost like an outdated, maybe even non-PC word or something. It's like the British community does not use sociopath uh, really? with nearly the frequency. I feel like psychopath is like, we imagine that as a murderous sociopath and a sociopath is what we would think of you as, which is somebody who's very high functioning and you wouldn't even necessarily know about it. I guess that is a little bit true because on the BBC Sherlock, he says... Uh, doesn't he say I'm not a psychopath I'm a high functioning sociopath or something isn't that his his bit isn't that his line I haven't seen it but it does sound like the kind of thing that people would write basically the same thing though in your book you describe um, growing up and there's a lot of a feeling of like you know you're always trying to get some sort of gain from any situation uh, and, and and looking at people in a way of like how can I how can I sort of one up them do you ever just chill out can you like sunbathe can you watch a movie and just chill out? Yes, I, I definitely can chill out. I don't think that is the distinction. The The really big distinction, and this is something I've kind of like learned more after the book, is after the book, I started to see a therapist who was like pretty good actually about mm. helping me to kind of like get more connected with my emotions. And I think the thing that I realized that is truly missing between me and other people in terms of like, why can't I just not manipulate? <laughs> why can't I treat life, you know, not like a game? Yeah. You know, <laughs> like, that's what I thought. I kept thinking like, uh -huh. you're obviously very good at it. And then that's what you were saying as well, that the sociopath is very good and very, uh, very intelligent, charming, and they're good at winning at life. But I'm sitting there thinking, that's true. But but why? Why does it? Why is there always a game happening? Why just relax? I'm, that's so. I guess that's what my question is. Yeah, can you just right. su, You know, spend the day sunbathing or something. I could spend the day su sunbathing. That's that's totally fine. But the thing that's missing is self-expression. You know, your purpose or the person that you are. This lack, total lack of self-expression that mm. psychopaths feel for the most part. What does that mean exactly? A lack of self-expression. All personality disorders have some issue with the personality, right? With your sense of self, with your sense of identity. That's why they are called personality disorders. And each one has their own sort of issue that defines it, right? So like a narcissist has a false sense of self that he presents to the world of I'm perfect, everything that I do is great. And then an inner sense of self of shame 
and I'm worthless and nobody loves me and etc. right? Borderline personality, they're like the chameleon, right? You put them in a particular situation and they will start kind of imitating and picking up on the, the personality characteristics of the people around them, right? So that's borderline. Yeah, the psychopath basically just doesn't have a sense of self. So a narcissist, it's very easy to hurt a narcissist's ego because oh. it's very important to them. Right. And it would be very difficult, if not impossible, to hurt the ego of a psychopath because they do not have a sense of self, almost like these people who do not have a sense of pain. It doesn't mean that there's not hurt happening, you know, but they're just not aware of it. It's not on the radar. It's like, what? that's amazing. Yeah, it is amazing. (laughs) Okay, so your book is actually awful. It's terribly written. It's, It's shit. How does that make you feel? I mean, you know, I don't mean it. I mean, I have, <laughs> yeah, 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 but I, <laughs> it doesn't bother me. It truly doesn't bother me. And it's like, sometimes I call these ego hits. Have you ever heard like the internet term is butt hurt? Like if yeah. somebody's butt hurt over something, it's because somebody's like hit them in their, yeah. basically their identity. My therapist called them identity hits. They're the right. things that hurt the most to you. And it's almost like, why did this one comment or this one thing that somebody did disregarding me or like, you know, a server would do something, right? But I say, you know, uh, psychopaths don't have a sense of self, but every once in a while, there is something, you know, I think that can still ego hurt a psychopath. Oh. Uh, but it's, I think it's related to the core reason why they don't have a sense of self. Like, why do you, why does a child not develop a sense of self? Because a sense of self doesn't develop until you're about two years old, right? And I have a lot of little baby nephews and nieces, and you can kind of see it happening. Like my nephew, who's a year and a half, just barely learned to point to himself when you say, Hmm. you know, where's blank, his name. Then he's just barely learned that, okay, it's me. That's me. (laughs) It's this name, right? And they... Before that, they just think of themselves as an extension of everybody else, mostly their mom, right? But then they start developing this sense of self around two. Psychopath doesn't develop it or doesn't develop it fully or develops it very, like, uh, minimally, right? So why does this happen? I think this is kind of a question that has been largely ignored, you know, or like wow. uh, kind of undeveloped by psychologists. But the people I talk to, the other psychopaths, think there's this one guy, he's like this army ranger sniper. And it's like, how do you grow up to become an army ranger sniper? And he's like, well, you're a psychopath, number one, but how do you become a psychopath is that your primary caregiver, at least one of your primary caregivers, disregards your individuality to such an extent that you just never want to develop that. Because if you did develop like a sense of identity, it would just keep getting these identity hits. It's like a protection thing. Yes, yes. I grew up the way that I did, probably because of genetics, right? And my siblings, some of them have like slightly psychopathic tendencies. In fact, one of my sisters, her husband's like, yeah, she's even more psychopathic than you are. And I'm like, okay. (laughs) (laughs) That's something that you grapple with a lot in the book, isn't it? The nature versus nurture debate. And I think you come to the conclusion that it's a bit of both, isn't it? Yes. And I mean, your your dad, I mean, this is something, again, I'm trying to learn how to uh, speak a little bit differently to you because I guess I don't have to worry as much about hurting your feelings or anything. Right. So I wouldn't usually say this, but I mean, your dad sounds like a real shit. Yeah. But also, you know, nature nurture, like his own childhood Mm. upbringing is just like rife with abuse, uh, neglect, being abandoned by his mother. I mean, his childhood is like 10 times worse than mine. For whatever reason, psychopaths have been divorced from how they got formed. Everybody's worried about their behavior now. And nobody's really thinking, well, how can we keep psychopaths from being made? Kent Kill, I think, a psychopath researcher, once was like, you know, they, he estimated, oh, they cost the world, you know, however many billions of dollars and just like destruction, right? And if it's like, well, if it's really that big of a problem, why are we spending all this money to imprison them when they're adults? Why not try to reach out to them when they're children and yeah. lead them a different direction? So I guess that's why I think it's so important is that it's, I just feel like, everybody has taken crazy pills almost about this one particular issue in which they cannot look at it rationally. And I think eventually, hopefully in like the next five or 10 years, we're going to see this sort of transition in thinking about psychopaths that we've seen in, for instance, the transgender community, where, you know, five, 10 years ago, 
before Caitlyn Jenner, it was like transgender. No, everybody yeah. was like free to say whatever bum bum stuff they wanted about transgender people. And now people are much more, you know, they see them as other humans. The psychopath thing is an awkward one because it's like it's asking uh, non psychopaths to care about a group of people who don't care about them. Yeah. In fact, it's interesting. So let, let's say you see empathy as a spectrum, right? Yeah. Psychopaths are on the low end. And then most normal people are kind of in the middle, honestly. They, they have failures of empathy all the time. You can see it, yeah. right? And then on the, the opposite spectrum, they're kind of people, I think of them as like uber empaths. And actually, they do sympathize with psychopaths. Okay, so let's say, I mean, there was an example at the very beginning of your book, which was actually a brilliant opening, really filmic, um, with the, there was an opossum in the pool and you just sort of <laughs> you sort of tried to push it down with a net and it sort of escaped mm -hmm. a few times you were going to sort of just drown it and i guess out of my like sort of morbid curiosity or something and then sort of just left it and then it was dead later so yes what i mean so are there any limits are there any limits to like you know somebody's i'm just trying to think of the worst thing ever like someone's pulling out a dog's eye or something is there any point when you're going to be like oh whoa 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 hey stop it come on uh yes there are limits and i think you know i was talking to another psychopath about this and he said because my limits are just so f much further mm. from everybody else's they assume there are no limits but there are limits so he was talking about something gross right yeah. he was just saying like if he's at a restaurant and he sees that somebody hasn't finished their food he'll actually ask the waiter, the server, to like box it up for him. But it, he's like, I don't have uh, zero limits though. He said he wouldn't, if somebody was eating on a piece of chicken, you know, just putting their mouth on the bone of the chicken, he wouldn't ask for that, right. no matter how much chicken was left there. So he has a limit, it's just further than most normal people. And it, he's that way about everything. He's, you know, he's come so close to death so many times and people are always like, you don't have any fear. But those are examples of, of, I suppose, the first one was revulsion around like the food and, and he has a low level there. And the second one was maybe risk taking. Yeah. But the thing that we're uh, non-psychopaths or non-sociopaths are really interested in is the empathy thing. If you were to see a cat, what, how would you feel if a cat was having its nose cut off right now? Let's say I thought it was like a bully that situation, like somebody's doing a wrong thing, okay. then I would probably be like, okay, we need to intervene. Let's say the cat was having its nose cut off because it's like getting surgery or something and it's cancer. You know, so for me, I would think, I don't know the full story. I think mm. people with empathy often do jump to conclusions and be yes. like, I do know the full story. Yeah. You know, this is obviously a bad person, but I would wait. I would wait and kind of like calmly talk to the person be like, okay, yeah. I see that you have this cat and you're cutting off the nose. What's going on here? That's why you're quite suitable to work in law, I suppose. And it's another thing you touch on in the book, uh, how you were able to be a bit more of a neutral judge right but that yeah i guess what i'm trying to get at is like is there anything you could walk into a room and see and go oh, oh god i feel terrible for that person or animal or whatever it might be i will keep thinking about this one andrew because i can't come up with one and i don't want to just do it because i'm like hmm. a hard ass but probably i guess my a loved one if uh, like i walked in and a loved one in basically like a horror film scene where they're obviously clearly being tortured by some like yeah. nefarious person or something yeah, I suppose that's maybe not so much empathy as like you're someone's doing something to someone who means something to you. This is why I kind of mentioned uh, bullies. Mm. I care for whatever reason. I don't know why. I care about there being like a fairness to things. Yeah. I, I also don't like violence perpetrated on anyone probably because I'm anti the death penalty. It, it is weird for me to deal with these empaths, for instance, who seem to be so hypocritical about so much, you know, like the classic one used against the people like right leaning conservative people is that they are opposed to abortion but pro the death penalty right yeah but there are a million of those like kind of discrepancies those inconsistencies that you see with normal people and i guess my reasoning is just way less emotional like your question i think yeah. is kind of like do you have these emotional reactions and the answer is even still no even after i've gotten like to be a more emotional person i've gotten more in touch with my emotions through therapy but i still don't think about those situations in an, an emotional way. I don't have the emotion mm. first and then kind of think second. If anything, yeah. I think first and then maybe have an, an emotion later, like outrage. I'm outraged that somebody thinks that they could like do this to somebody else. Yeah, the examples you gave about abortion and the death penalty, I think that really speaks to what you were saying about the self because I think that's 
not always motivated, in fact, very rarely motivated by emotion. I think people's beliefs in uh, whether abortion should be legal or not, or the death penalty, I think that's really about ideology and, and what kind of person you want to present as yourself to the world and and how you want other people to view you and how you want to view yourself. Yes. So it, it's I'm, I'm a kind of person who doesn't like the death penalty. That's who I am. I mean, I make documentaries where I end up talking to uh, people in horrible situations a lot of the time. And, and I've this is something that I think a lot of journalists wouldn't admit is that although there is a part of me that feels empathy and feels awful for them, the fact is I've got a job to do and there's a camera in my face and it's very hard to be totally empathetic in that moment. And, and yet I would also say I'm very empathetic in terms of if I saw something happening to a dog, I would just be in bits. I'd be so upset by that. It's what you say, isn't it? A spectrum. I think a lot of people are kidding themselves about and trying to present a more empathetic version of themselves than, than is reality. I think they're just limitations to empathy. I think people, this is true even of psychopaths who start identifying with their own emotions, is emotions give you some sort of truth. They do. But I think uh, it's common for people to just have an emotional reaction and be like, I feel bad about this. Therefore, the thing is bad. Do you know Ben Shapiro? Have you heard of him? A little bit. He's a sort of public public speaker. He seems like a horrible person, I think, anyway. But he's always saying facts don't have feelings. That's 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 what he says. Ah. A lot of the, so I wonder if he might be... And that's another thing. By talking to you, I end up just... And this was something John Ronson said not to do in the psychopath test, but I end up identifying everyone, everyone I've ever met as like, okay, they must be a sociopath. That person is. What should I look out for? So it's a little bit difficult because if you're just like looking at a list, then you're, you're definitely going to see everybody has those traits to a certain extent. I think that's what's so interesting about uh, psychopathy, the way that we currently diagnose it with like this list of traits, lack of empathy, no guilt, uh, like very low feelings, you know, uh, superficial charm. Yeah. Uh, manipulation, you know, and yeah. it's like, well, okay, everybody does these things at a certain point. That's everyone I know. Yes. So it's so easy to just kind of look at people and be like, oh, this is, you know, they must be a sociopath because they manifest these behaviors sometimes. And then the psychologists are like, it has to be like quite, a, quite frequently that they do this. Right. And it's like, okay, well, who says what's quite frequently? And definitely it changes from culture to culture. Right. So there's a weird kind of ethnocentricity in the definition, too, because you're like, well, what, you know, what would be in, acceptable in one culture is not acceptable in another culture. Right. And cultures yeah. just view some of those behaviors differently. So I that this is why I'm like, just talk about like its origins, like the psychopath just has a very weak sense of self. But I, I've heard it said that there's a that you can do like CAT scans or MRI, MRI scans. Uh, and there are differences in the brains of people uh, who are sociopaths. Is that right? Well, in order to do that, Andrew, you would have to look at, you'd have to first be able to distinguish between who are psychopaths and not. And can you? Well, there's, there's a few people I suspect. I've got them all on a list. You have a list in your mind of people in your life, possibly, or in the public eye, who possibly are psychopaths, but you just can't say who. Right. That is the problem that researchers have. It's not yeah. any any more simple or straightforward for the researchers than it is for you. And it is like this huge source of contention in the field right now about like who, you know, what sort of diagnostic test are we going to use? The, the, mo the kind of gold standard one is like under, you know, all of this uh, criticism, right? The, yeah, the psychopath hair. checklist. Yes, the hair one, right? Yeah. Because they're like, you you just look at a bunch of criminals. <laughs> yeah, that that annoyed you. I could tell from the book, and it actually makes a lot of sense what you say because they they equally weight characteristics that we might consider to to be typical of a sociopath, uh, and and actions that they've done which might be criminal um especially one because i was trying when i read that john ronson book i was trying to diagnose all my friends with uh, as being psychopaths just because it was something mm -hmm. to do and um yeah i couldn't i couldn't get them on the actions bit because very few of them had like you know burned animals and uh been arrested and that kind of thing but they were also from sort of quite middle class upstanding families where that wasn't you know wasn't really on you don't just go and get yourself arrested it wouldn't help for example to be a lawyer like you are that wouldn't be advantageous for a psychopath to do that so it made no sense to me that that was equally weighted with the the personality attributes it's statistics like 101 to look at this and be like this looks super flawed yeah yeah most so most psychopaths are probably not murderers and things when you talk to me are you looking to gain some advantage from me have you spotted weak points so like basically 100 percent 
would have been true of like former me because as I said before there's no self-expression so what ends up happening is you in in order to make any sort of decision like let's say the decision to gain you and do it like I'm coming into this conversation do I want to lie or what what sort mm. of uh, objective do I want to accomplish right sure. which everyone has to an extent yeah to a certain extent but uh, so pre if you have a very weak sense of self right you wouldn't come into an interview like this and say I'm going to tell the truth because I'm a truthful person because you have no sense no conception of yourself as being a truthful person hmm. you don't have a conception of yourself as being any sort of person at all so you can't be process outcome oriented because there's no process to abide by. You can't just self-express. You can't just be yourself. You don't know who yourself is, right? That's So you can never just be yourself. You always... <laughs> you ever have a game plan. There's just like a vacuum. Yes, yes. And so in the absence of like, you can't be yourself, then you have to figure out something else. So most psychopaths are very outcome-oriented. Instead, they're kind of like, well, if I tell the truth in this situation, I get X. If I lie, I get Y. And which one do I prefer? And that's basically all of their decision-making. Right. But if you think that way, you're going to be 100 percent of the time manipulative because all you care about is the way that somebody's going to react to you and what you say. Tell the truth yeah. or don't tell the truth. Right. So that's where the manipulation comes from. And you can't tell them to stop manipulating because they don't know any other way to be. There's like nothing to replace it with. Before, it would have been like, yeah, I'll just come in and what is the outcome that I'm looking for? You know, self-promotion or I, I don't know, <laughs> whatever it would be. Yeah. Right. And then now I can be like, you know, I'll just tell the truth because I, I prefer the truth. I'm a truth lover, actually. The catch-22 there is that if you were still in that former state, you would be saying and the same and acting the same as you are now. Uh, really? You think so? Why? Well, because you'd, you'd be trying to show that you're not doing that. Uh, I don't think at the time I would have understood this to be a thing, but it is true now that I'm saying it, let's say there was like another me, you know, a younger me or something who's listening to it and was like, oh, that's a good, good reasoning. That's a good excuse. I'm just going to listen to this word for word and repeat it when I hear somebody else yeah. <laughs> ask this question. I can yeah. see that. And that's actually why they say, I guess, uh, they say the common wisdom is that there is no treatment for psychopathy, right? And the basis of this is like pretty much just one test that was done like in the 70s or 80s in which they all got together kind of like it seemed like at a summer camp type environment and they yeah. would have all these group therapy sessions right and then the psychopaths ended up worse afterwards they they just learned how to like um lie better exactly as okay. you said they learned how to like give the right answer uh in a better more authentic seeming way how would you feel if somebody came in now and I'll, I'll stop asking these these questions but I'm just fascinated if somebody came in and just sort of just started strangling me and, mm -hmm. and because I feel like this is that we're getting on really well and I feel like uh, you're extremely charming and I, that you're my friend now <laughs> so <laughs> if and I'm just being honest about how I feel I feel you're my friend and uh, if you were now uh, were near me, I could say, hey, let's go get a coffee and we'll all hang out. And uh, and, and yeah, so <laughs> how would it fit if somebody, yeah, oh, I just started having a heart attack now. Uh, how would you how, how would you feel? Um, well, I do not feel connected to you, Andrew, and mm. not in a bad way. Yeah, it's upsetting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I feel like uh, I don't, I don't know what what the connection that you feel to me is. Mm -hmm. I think that that probably is again like some evolutionary shortcut that maybe yeah. you haven't examined. And I do think that that people probably exploit that, and other people who do experience that is yeah. like, okay, we've only been talking for thirty minutes, and there's a connection there, right? Yep. Uh, so I, I think, uh, I don't experience that. And I think it's just because I don't have the same shortcuts. I don't have the same emotional shortcuts. I don't think it's because we can't be friends. You know, I absolutely think that we could develop a friendship, but it would be kind of like, I mean, to me, you almost sound like these, uh, made for TV movies where it's like, Oh, love at first sight or something, you know? <laughs> right. No, I meant, I meant in a platonic way. <laughs> Just yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> but I still, I still understand. It, it takes like a very long time for me to feel an emotional connection for the most sure. part. You know, I may feel an energy, 
I may feel like, oh, this is a good vibe, you know, or we're having a good conversation or something. Do you feel a good vibe with me? Uh, I would say four out of 10, a good vibe. <laughs> four out of 10? <laughs> yeah. Is that four out of 10 compared to people you've known a long time or compared to most interviews you have? Compared to uh, everybody, all people I've known a long time, yeah. <laughs> what about compared to most interviews? Most interviews, I guess 10 out of 10. Oh, I, we're having yes. a fun time. <laughs> That's great. That's brilliant. Um, if you don't have that immediate connection with people, how can you enjoy a movie where where the main thing is that you're supposed to empathize with the character? So this is, I actually think, an interesting kind of distinction. Did you know, Andrew, that uh, starting about the age of six, a child can hear the difference between hot water being poured and cold water being poured no, into a glass. That's insane. It's crazy. Did you even know that that was something that you could do, Andrew? No, no. There's, I mean, the, the things I don't know could fill the <laughs> Albert Hall. I mean, so I think it's kind of the same with psychopaths. You may think that what you're doing 100% of the time in watching the movie is empathizing, but actually you're being manipulated, right? You're having your own reaction to a particular situation because of the music. You know, like a really great example of this is horror, right? Like you can be scared and there's not a character at all who's being scared. You're not empathizing. You actually are just scared. You're scared of the situation, mm. right? So I still get, uh, so I think of it as like empathizing versus you're being moved, right? You can say that music is very moving yeah. without, you're not empathizing with the conductor. You're not empathizing with the with the composer, you're not empathizing with anybody. The, the music is still moving though to you. It, it provokes an emotional reaction. In okay, so, so what's your favorite film, for example? My favorite film is Vertigo, the Alfred Hitchcock film, yeah. Right, so you've got, is it James Stewart? Yes. Yeah, okay, uh -huh. so you've got James Stewart is feeling all sad because he let his friend die on a roof or something. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> and he's in bits he's all upset are you not uh -huh. being emotionally moved and thinking god i can empath empathize with him feeling this vertigo stuff no i'm not a, i definitely am not emotionally moved the reason why i like vertigo is because the viewer is totally manipulated <laughs> it's like one of these <laughs> these movies in which you think the movie's about one thing and you're right. like, wow, that's really just the end. Okay. That's the way it ends. There's a twist. <laughs> yes, there is a twist. And not only this, yeah. it's just so like everyone always talks about the vertigo shot as being the genius. But I think the genius is all the shots before. Like right. he doesn't do, what do we say? These like, uh, when they, they show a bunch of shots in quick succession, what do we call those? Uh, a montage. Yeah, montage. He doesn't yeah. do montages. Everything is so long that you just have like a sense that the movie's over. You're like, yeah, it's probably been an hour and a half, right? But actually, if you time it, it's only been like 50 minutes, the right. first part. But he, he kind of makes you feel time in this extended way, this very manipulative way where you're like, that's the end of the movie. And you honestly believe that's the end of the movie. And then it just keeps going and you're like, what? <laughs> it sounds like you're appreciating the craft of the director and, and the, the manipulativeness. Is that a word? Yes. Uh -huh. Well, the manipulation. Mani the manipulation <laughs> of of the the bad guys the ones doing these you know so i, I can imagine you no might... no no no. it's not the manipulation of the bad guys hmm. it's the way that hitchcock has manipulated you the viewer into Ooh. thinking that this is the movie and now it's over and that's just it okay yeah so the sixth sense oh sixth sense is pretty good too because you're also like yeah manipulated you're kind of like tricked or whatever and you like being manipulated i suppose in those oh yeah yeah, I like I like oh, being manipulated. Wow. Even yeah, I've always liked to be seduced too. Huh. It's like, I mean, it's fun. It's like somebody tickling you. You know, you're like. <laughs> That's so fascinating, though. You know, a lot of the things we watch in the movies, maybe it's someone dying a slow death or something. It's things that we don't really want to happen to us in real life, but we're getting tantalizingly mm. close. And it sounds like something you might do in real life is manipulate people. Um, and you wouldn't want to be manipulated in real life. It's not real, so it's okay, and you're being manipulated. Yeah, well, it's like a roller coaster. Like you want to have, you want to be scared. You want to have that reaction provoked in yeah. you. But you couldn't enjoy a, a romantic comedy then, could you? No, oh, I mean, I can enjoy like clever acting and funny jokes and stuff for sure. <laughs> Do you ever feel jealousy for people who have, I suppose, a, a wider spectrum of 
uh, emotion and empathy? That's a good question. I think that I feel uh, stuff missing sometimes. You know, like I, I obviously felt enough stuff missing that I went to therapy for like mm. four or five years, you know, and tried to get more in touch with like my own emotional reactions. You know, it's still an issue in my relationships that I can be so um, kind of on and off, you know, like connected with them seeming and then, you know, that I use the word like they're off my radar. You know, yeah. if they're off my radar, then it's almost like they don't exist. And I think for some people that can be very hurtful to feel that like this, the loved one, you know, the person that you love the most or something is not thinking about you all the time, not even in the background, <laughs> just yeah. completely off. I think we can all relate to that in some ways, though. Although I always found it hard. Yeah, when I had friends of mine who were ghosting uh, a, a girl, for example, they were just not replying to the messages and they just would never do it again. They would never ever reply, you know, for all the, the girl knows, this guy died or something, you know, he's right. just never gonna. And although I understood the desire to not want to talk to this person again and that it would be easier to not have to explain anything, I couldn't understand how that person could go to sleep at night knowing there was somebody else a few miles away who couldn't sleep because they were so stressed by this whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. But it doesn't bother, it wouldn't bother you. Yeah, I mean, I do think it's not good behavior. Okay. It's not like I endorse that behavior. Like I can be bothered intellectually, I guess, too. Like I can be just intellectually bothered, you know, but that somebody deserves an explanation or something. But then I was just listening again to, you know, that Alanis Morissette yeah. song, You Oughta Know. Yeah. And for the first time I was like, wow, she sounds super like clingy. And it yeah. sounds like he broke up with her. So why does she keep showing up to his door and calling him during dinner? <laughs> <laughs> she like, sounds this is so just angry. Stalking. Yes. Yeah. I was like, this is also inappropriate. I think Alanis Morissette's songs have probably been um, sort of diagnosed and analyzed and scrutinized more than anyone's songs in the last sort of 50 years. But now in woke culture, I'm like, you know, if somebody, especially you imagine it was a, a dude singing about a girl, people would definitely be like, this, this needs a <laughs> lawsuit to prevent this. <laughs> Cops need to be called. She's really quite angry. But I suppose that she's speaking for the suppressed uh, gender in that, in that sense. And she, you know. I guess. Yeah, that's a good one, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> if any listeners are wondering what Andrew's uh, virtue position on this is. <laughs> God, do I sound she's, virtuous now? Oh, no. Yeah, she's definitely speaking for the oppressed. I don't want to be a virtue signaler. I hate virtue signaler. <laughs> no, I think it's good. Well, people <laughs> misunderstand you otherwise. Now in this day, somebody said this. Yeah. Uh, I guess there was a, a cast member from Glee who unfortunately drowned in a lake, sure. right? Yes. And yeah. then the cast members from Glee, when they finally found the body, they all tweeted, you know, their huge condolences. And I guess one person didn't do it and or they didn't do it enough. And people were like, terrible, this oh person's God. terrible, heartless. Yeah, that drives <laughs> yeah. me. That keeps me up at night. I get so angry about the hypocrisy of woke culture. Yes, and actually it's interesting because my sister-in-law was talking about, she's like, isn't it so crazy that there was a, a certain time period of mourning, you know, not even that long ago, 100 years ago or something, like you had to mourn for a year if your spouse died. And, mm. you know, wouldn't that feel so oppressive? And I was like, in some ways, yes, but in some ways it would be nice to just know, oh, all you have to do is mourn for a year, then go ahead and start dating, you yeah. know, and nobody can really judge you. Because bet, right yeah. now... Yeah, everybody's so, all the time guessing, like, how long is too you know, enough before people, you know, start stop uh, judging me for doing yeah. this type of behavior. So again, is that, yeah, is that is that an innate empathy, or is this a lot? A lot of it is just concern about judgment from peers, and I, I guess it, some of it, it just feels like you don't have it um, that that fear of judgment as much. Uh, I definitely have a fear of mobs, you know, mob mentality, because yeah. I think that it's so irrational. And I know that that comes from an emotional space that that most people have that I do not have, because okay. I've never experienced like mob mentality or this like rushed moral judgment uh, that other people engage in. And in fact, I basically don't do moral judgments at all. It's basically like you guys are all heroin addicts to me, you know, okay. because <laughs> you're engaging in this thing in order to like feel more alive and i'm like but can't you see the destruction that comes along with it yeah well i i think so much of it though is is performative 
I think so mm. am I. And that, that's something I could probably tell you as a, as a non-sociopath that I, I, there are empaths. There are people who extremely seem to be upset by everything. But I, I really do think there's a lot that has to be, is expected of you. For example, mourning for a certain amount of time, uh, mm-hmm. tweeting the right tweet. People don't care. People are horrible when they're left to their own devices. So I think, I think, I mean, I, I feel like I, I'd like to think I'm more empathetic than a lot of people I know. And mm-hmm. yeah, then they judge and they'll put tweets and Instagram messages about this and that. And everybody's trying to win at being the most empathetic person. And I guess you're just out of that race. You don't care. Yeah. And every once in a while, if I see something particularly egregious on Twitter, then I'll say, hey, you know, this this is not a thing. Logically, it's not a yeah. thing. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of logically not a thing, this is going to be murky waters here because you are quite religious. Is mm-hmm. that, and you teach at a Sunday school, and you're part of the the Mormon uh, the Mormon Church, right? Yes. Is it the Mormon correct. Church or the Church the Church of Latter Day Saints? What's the difference? Yeah, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints. Yeah. Okay. They, they, they have a new push. They want us to use the full name. Sometimes oh. I shorten it to Restored Church of Jesus. Okay. <laughs> you know, you don't really believe there was like Jesus and stuff. Do you, maybe you do, you do? See, I think there was. Jesus. And okay. I think most people think there was Jesus. They just are like, maybe he was just a good teacher or sure. not a good teacher. Okay, but not not like Moses. Moses probably existed too, but did he actually part the Red Sea? I don't know. So like the my theory of Mormonism, I think is actually the theory of Mormonism. It's it's I li- it's more science fiction, I think, than most people would imagine, than most like kind of Christian sorts of religions. Okay. So like the idea is that consciousness uh, originated our consciousness, like the kind of humankind consciousness, originated not here on this earth, but some different location, right? And it originated from a particular type of matter that Mormon theology calls intelligence. You okay. know, so the intelligences are like different matters. Is it similar so to that, Scientology in that sense? I actually don't know Scientology that They've well, got a, so. a similar sort of a, a creation story. Would I be right in surmising that you... Um, believe in this in an allegorical fashion but not in a in a literal sense yeah allegorical fashion i definitely do believe that consciousness developed some other place than earth first Hmm. what about evolution and all of that stuff so like if if you kind of believe this basically then the mormon theology is this world is a simulation it's very related i think to who is it elon musk who believes that this is a simulation yes you know Kind of similar uh, yeah. beliefs of like, you know, there are certain aspects of uh, reality that make it seem like this place was created in a way that a simulation is created. It's so funny because I think, so I operate under the uh, ass- assumption that there's no gods. And I see people who are religious as clinging to something because they're so worried about death and not having an afterlife and what the meaning of everything is. And it feels like you're coming at it from a totally different place. And it's like you're coming at it because you need a a structure and and moral guidance, a moral code. Is that fair to say? 100%. I think that's how I would have thought of it until maybe like several years ago. And here's the thing with Mormonism. I'm not I don't think that I am, at least. I don't think I'm clinging to it. Hmm. I just think, actually, it's a plausible story. Have you ever wanted to kill someone? Have you ever come close to killing anyone? Um, Only, like, once, kind of, like, in rage, anger. But it was kind of a very just, like, um, I think it's actually kind of like a, one of the other psychopaths I've met calls it a gray rage, right? And the gray hmm. rage happens in, like, a very predictable situation which is that someone who does not have authority over you is exercising authority over you. And for whatever reason, it just like uh, triggers a psychopath in a way that nothing else does. Yeah, this was in the book when you were told not to walk in a certain place, right? Yes, by this uh, uh, in the Washington DC metro uh, worker who (laughs) told me to not do that. But again, you know, it's like, would I have actually killed the person? I don't think so because I intentionally don't own weapons. Do you just you just wanted to feel the power of knowing you could kill them? Actually, in that situation, I think I was out of control. I think I was like, uh, in that moment, I just was like on autopilot. Wow, you were just frothing at the mouth. You were just like, you don't tell me to step in this place. Yeah, in a very weird way. And who knows why it happens? I think that's really interesting too. I think it's interesting that that experience is pretty common. 
among psychopaths is that they will that type of situation will trigger that sort of reaction hmm. um, one other thing i want to mention is like the yeah the bit i just read about appendicitis so you went to school for like what was it a week or so after your appendix had burst yes oh my god like why why <laughs> why don't you feel pain like other people I think, uh, and this is, I think it's like related again to like the sense of self, really weak sense of self. Like psychopaths are, are known for being really able, very well, uh, very good at the compartmentalizing, mm. right? So it's kind of like, once you kind of acknowledge this truth, then it's like, I can just kind of ignore it. It is true. Psychopaths are known to not learn very well by experience. Like they can suffer consequence after consequence after consequence. Mm. And it doesn't matter. And in fact, it feels awesome. And we call those psychopaths, I do at least, playground stage psychopaths, the right. ones that have like very low reaction to negative consequences. And it, it's almost like Teflon, you know, like nothing seems to stick to them. Um, do your friends and family know about your condition? Yes. And in fact, uh, it's a little bit sloppy, I have to say. You know, it's not like I was like came out to them. You know, I told them when I was started doing the blog, my immediate family, and then people would just kind of find out. But it's funny, I had like a little bit of a outdoor socially distanced family reunion <laughs> type thing in which one of my cousins was asking me about like the book and psychopaths and stuff. And then the other cousin was like, wait, what? What's happening? <laughs> and I was like, oh, I'm a psychopath. Yeah. She's like, oh, just because I live in Texas, I don't <laughs> get told anything. <laughs> Is there a fear of leaving children with you? I mean, presumably, as much as you love your family's babies, uh -huh. couldn't there be a bit where they're annoying you a bit and you're just like, oh, screw this, I'm throwing them in the garbage? Yeah, I would say probably it's there's a, a greater chance of like recklessness with them mm -hmm. and like uh, over exuberant roughhousing. You know, yeah. like I, I said to the, I said to my also psychopath, significant other i was like oh my baby nephew likes to get choked and she was like don't tell anyone that oh my god you should <laughs> but he kind of does little <laughs> oh but he's gonna grow up having like a sexual fantasy about that could be or whatever but i i thought like i'm impacting his windpipe i'm just like grabbing him by the neck sure you know? you're just playing with him tell me about this yes. significant other how, how did you meet on the blog yes yes uh-huh um, what's he or her like? You know, in writing the second book, she was like the first person in this like series okay. of like meeting a bunch of people in a row. And the first time she came out, it was like fine and stuff, but like mm, she was she was very like playground stage at the time. And even though I I understand psychopaths that are like going through that because I did too, like in my twenties, yeah. <laughs> go through this playground stage of not caring. You can't really relate to somebody, you know, deeply. Uh, on any sort of emotional level who's kind of that superficial about life. <laughs> yeah. So nothing happened. But then she came like nine months later and she had had like all these kind of bad things happen to her, uh, kind of reversals of fortune. And then so she was she was more self-introspective. Uh, wow. And those, so we, yeah, we connected differently that time. And then... Couldn't yeah. she have been manipulating you? Do you worry that you're manipulating each other? Well, she definitely was trying to manipulate me at the beginning. Because remember, there was like that nine months in between. And she like sent me like an email or a text like a month later being like, you know, I think I'm like falling in love with you or something. Mm. And I was like, or I think I'm developing a crush on you. And I was like, oh, okay. Is it pleasant? And she's admitted now she was just like trying to seduce me and then like, you know, kind of ruin me a little bit. <laughs> she just She just wanted, oh, she wanted to ruin you after. Well, just kind of, she's very like, um, what do we say? Like likes to conquer things. What's an argument like between two <laughs> psychopaths? Uh, well, f first, like there were very few arguments at first because it was like, okay, I just understand like what you're going through and stuff and understand that this is like a issue, you know? And I think psychopaths generally are like super easy going. But yeah. then she started like getting more and more in touch with her emotions, right? And so then it was like a little bit difficult for her because when psychopaths start to get in touch with their emotions, it's like a second puberty. It's like super awkward because you're having all these emotional experiences that you've never had before. So that you believe there's room for growth? Oh yeah, absolutely. I And I, that's why I think, I mean, this, the state of current research about psychopaths is just pitiful. What's your 
second book about and when do you think it might come out? Uh, it would probably come out, my guess is like a year and a half, two-ish years, because mm -hmm. uh, it's just at the proposal stage. But it's basically, I forget, I should probably learn this better because it has a cute little subtitle or something that's like a perspective uh, on identity seen from the lens of those who don't have it, right? Okay. So it's basically kind of looks at like what we say, a little bit the woke culture, and people, all these people who have like these strong identities, like, you know, I am anti-abortion, pro-death penalty, or vice versa, yeah. right? <laughs> Pro-abortion, yeah. anti-death penalty. And it's funny that those seem to flip, you know? I, yeah. How many people do you know who are anti-abortion and anti-death penalty? Boy, do I like interviewing psychopaths. The question is, do you like watching interviews with psychopaths? Because if you do, you're in luck. I've got ones here with H.G. Tudor, another one with Emmy Thomas, and also Dr. Jim Fallon, the neuroscientist who realized he was a psychopath from his brain scan. So you're spoiled for choice here with more videos to keep watching.